spending some time with fans and get the picture taken with a couple of Blue Jay fans here at Fenway Park just moments before the beginning of this game. Let's check out the starting lineup for the Blue Jays today, including a guy who is suddenly hot, Kendrys Morales, in his last eight games, hitting almost 400 and getting close to 200 on the season. And the same can be said for Devin Travis. They changed an error to a hit last night, so two hits last night for Travis and a five-game hitting streak. A pace 25 year old did Roger Rodriguez. He's in his fourth season with the Red Sox. He was acquired in a trade mid season in 2014 for the big reliever Andrew Miller from Baltimore. So he is healthy. He is throwing the ball very well of late and he's ready to take on the Blue Jays. And he faces Teoscar Hernandez as this one gets underway on a very bright sunny afternoon here in Boston. Hernandez yesterday went 0 for 3 hit by a pitch had a couple of hits a double and a triple in the opening game of the series back on Monday chases that belt high fastball and Rodriguez quickly out in front 0 and 2 Rodriguez a guy who's had a lot of trouble with his right knee both in 2016 and 2017 but as Buck said he's healthy now and they don't need him to be their number one or number two but a pretty good arm to have near the back end of your rotation. Five and one with a 402 ERA on the season, and he makes quick work of Hernandez. Well, the Red Sox have won the first two games of the series, so they can rest some of their regulars in the app. That JD, JD Martinez starts in left field, and there's the first baseman, Blake Swihart, making his first ever start at first base. He's naturally a catcher. We have seen him play in left field against the Blue Jays, and today he's starting at first base to give Mitch Moreland the day off. Switch hitter, and he's always been a highly touted prospect, but he hasn't had the ability to put things together yet. In the two spot again today is Kevin Pillar. John Gibbons moving him up there with Josh Donaldson out of the lineup, and Pillar was at a really good year. Had a rough day yesterday. Went 0 for 5 with four strikeouts. Now to play 0 and 2, hitting 271 with four homers on the season. Blue Jays off to Detroit after the game tonight. They'll resume the road trip with a three game series beginning Friday. The Red Sox are headed to Houston tonight for a big series with the world champion Astros, a four game series that starts tomorrow night. 0 2. And a fly ball into right field. Jackie Bradley Jr. is there to make the catch two down. It is absolutely a perfect day for baseball here in Boston. You see Jackie Bradley Jr. in right field. Mookie Betts still out of the lineup with that sore side. And spectacular day. 19 degrees, a little bit of a breeze blowing from the right field corner over across the diamond toward left. But it doesn't get any better than this. This is a beautiful ballpark on a great afternoon. If you can get a bunch of baseball people together and find nobody who will complain about it either being too cold or too hot, it's perfect. And this is right in that perfect zone. It's Jan Herbert Solarte, another start at short. So Urshela is in the lineup today, but he's at third. And Solarte stays at short. Remember, there was a lot of hesitation at the beginning about could they put Solarte at short, and they put him there and have left him there for the last few games. So although Urshela's back in, he's at third, Solarte at short, not the other way around. Soft liner out to second, easy play for Holt, and an easy top of the first for Eduardo Rodriguez. Sam Gavilio will make his Fenway Park debut on the other side.
from the Boston Red Sox 38 17. And here's a look at the lineup. Andrew Benintendi is in center field today. And it's been a nice job against the Blue Jays and a nice job in this series specifically, as has his teammate J.D. Martinez, who is three for seven in the series, and all three hits are for extra bases. Well, Sam Gavilio make his first start against the Boston Red Sox. He's faced twice earlier this season, both times in relief, four and a third, two hits allowed, both times he's faced him. He's made two starts, and they've both been very good. He's been very efficient with his pitches, averaging just over 15 pitches per inning. And he throws all of his pitches for strikes. And another aspect that's really appealing to his pitching coach, Pete Walker, is the fact he works quickly. Doesn't waste any time looking for that sign and anxious to throw the pitch. First pitch swing and a foul back by Benintendi. It's it up on top of the roof up above us here at Fenway Park. Benintendi's in center field. Bradley is in right. J.D. Martinez is in left. When they put Martinez in the outfield, here at home they don't want him in right because it's just too big too much space as Ben and Tenney hits a little roller that will stay fair and smoke will make the easy play and as Ben and Tenney is retired for round number one well, take a look at the defense you're going to get a lot of ground balls with Emilio on the mound and Gio Urshela is a natural third baseman but this is his first start as a Blue Jay at third base he's a very good defender at third that's his natural position as we mentioned he's got a strong arm and he's much more comfortable at third and he could get a lot of action with Gavilio on the mound today. Number two hitter is Xander Bogarts, the shortstop for the Red Sox. 283 with eight homers. Got to eight homers this year, yesterday in his 38th game of the season. It took him 117 games last year to get to eight homers. And there's a curveball taken low for ball one. Sam Gavilio spent last year with both Seattle and then Kansas City was claimed on waivers by the Royals from the Mariners the Blue Jays picked him up on a deal on March the 21st for future considerations and he went down to Buffalo to start the year and made five great starts a 186 ERA in those five starts Blue Jays had a need he got the call Remember he had those two relief appearances as Buck mentioned against the Red Sox right at the beginning of his Blue Jay tenure went three innings in relief in one of those games picked up the win. Was the day he was called up. Here's Urshela, as Buck said, with a play, the throw right on the money, two down, and there's nothing fancy about Sam Gavilia. No, not at all. He's not going to light up the radar gun. He's not going to throw it in the mid 90s, but he'll throw a lot of fastballs, and they're mostly sinking fastballs. He'll throw 25% of his pitches, they'll be sliders, and he uses that oftentimes to polish off the right handed hitters. The changeup he learned in college, he played at Oregon State, he's an Oregon native. And he learned that changeup. He uses a split grip to take the velocity off his fastball, and it's been a very good pitch for him. Fifth round pick back in 2011 by the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, as Buck mentioned, out of Oregon State. Didn't break into the big leagues until 2017. So he's a little bit older, maybe, than people think he is. He's actually one week older than Joe Biagini. Biagini turned 28 yesterday, Gabilio turned 28 eight days ago. Ball and a strike on J.D. Martinez. Gavilio and Luke Maley were actually teammates in 2013 in the Arizona Fall League. The Blue Jays had a lot of players on that team, and at the time, Maley was with Tampa Bay. Gavilio was with the Cardinals. There's about four or five teams that will send players to a specific team. In fact, Tim Leeper was the coach. He was the third base coach on that Salt River Rafters Arizona Fall League team. Aaron Sanchez was on the team Bo Schultz was on the team Marcus Stroman they had quite a Blue Jays flavor to that team and Gavilio was one of the pitchers and Gavilio making some very good pitches here in the first inning and he gets three consecutive ground ball outs to take care of the Red Sox in order.
Days on Sportsnet. Presented by Honda. At the checkered flag event, the real victory lap is the drive home. Top second on a beautiful afternoon. Welcome back to Boston. Dan Schulman, Buck Martinez, and Hazel May. The Blue Jays looking to salvage the final game of this series after consecutive 8-3 to three defeats. A three up, three down first for both Eduardo Rodriguez and Sam Gaviglia. And here's Justin Smoke. Hit a home run yesterday, his eighth of the season. And did that get through the catcher? I don't think that uh, Vasquez hit that one. I think it got Jerry Lane. Yeah, it sure did. And he wasn't too happy about no, it. No, I think our home plate mic is working. Yeah, it sure is. And Vasquez just had a swing and a miss trying to catch that pitch. Jerry Lane says, Can you get a catcher in wow. here that can catch? <laughs> He wanted to punch him in the back of the head. I mean, it was also a. I mean, look where that pitch was. And yeah. It was called a ball. Yeah. Because Lane was getting out of the way and Vasquez didn't catch it. Lane was running for cover. This is really unusual, but I don't know what happened to Vasquez. He set up inside. The ball is up and away, and it hit him right on the knee. Mm. One one to smoke. That's when the umpire leans over and says, I'll get you when you hit. Because <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of a fraternity, right? You're in this, oh, you're absolutely. in this together back there. Yeah. And you know what? It used to be a much smaller fraternity because they had league umpires. Right. Smoke asked for time. After smoke, it'll be Kendrys Morales and then Devin Travis. Got jammed and a three hopper out to short. Easy play for Bogarts. One down. Eduardo Rodriguez is really on a very good roll right now, as we mentioned. He just turned 25 years old in April. And you look at his last couple of starts, he's been terrific. Fastball changeup. And then he'll cut that ball inside. That was the pitch they got smoked to ground out the short on. Once in a while, he'll throw a bigger cutter and it'll look like a slider, but. He's going to come at you with mostly fastballs and changeups. There's Morales, who continues to put together good at bats over the last week or so. In this series, in two games against Boston, he's three for seven with a double, and that doesn't count. Well, it doesn't count as a hit, it counts as an out. The great play that Jackie Bradley Jr. made on Monday afternoon out in the triangle with what would have been another double for Morales. Well located right there, and Rodriguez out in front of 2. Hey, that's the slider. It's 84 miles an hour, the little bit deeper break. But Morales, since he's gotten rid of the glasses, that strokes come around. He said he was seeing the ball too well. I never had that problem. <laughs> Blue Jays just grateful to see Morales swinging it better, Travis swinging it better, but a lot of other guys have to help them out right now. Runs have been tough to come by for the Blue Jays in the month of May. Wins have been tough to come by in the month of May. 0 2. And yeah, they will finish the month of May without having won consecutive back to back games. They just haven't put anything together. And it's been a little bit of everything, Dan. We've talked about the starting pitching, but the defense hasn't been great, the offense hasn't been good. You talked about the defense. It's not, you can't just look at errors. It's plays that could be made that aren't, that aren't, aren't scored as errors. Well, they'll get one runner, but they don't get the double play. Uh, just yesterday, Hernandez hit a ball in right field, probably should have been caught. It gets over his head. Solarte can't take the throw from Maley, the short hop at second, and put a tag down on a stolen base attempt. Backhanded to Bogarts. He knows who's running, takes his time. Two down. Got the ball off Biagini's glove that then bounced into shallow right field. Instead of getting one, maybe two outs, they don't get any. You can't give good teams extra outs, and the Blue Jays did that yesterday. But again, it's as you said, it's it's really every part of the game right now that's hurting the Blue Jays, and that's how you you go 12 and 24 in your last 36. And the average is 219 for the offense, and the starters have won just six games in the last 36. You just can't dig yourself out from early. Deficits with the starters falling behind so often. Devin Travis, like Morales, heating up. Five game hitting streak. He's five for 11 with a double and a triple in his last three games.
That's another good sign right there. I know it's a foul ball, but he is really good when he's hitting the ball to the right of second base. When you're not swinging the bat well, the first thing you do is say, I got to hit it hard. So you think about pulling the ball. And when you pull the ball, you're going to miss a lot of pitches, especially breaking balls. But now Devin's more confident that he's swinging the bat much better. So he's going to let the ball travel. And that's why he's hitting so many balls to the right side. And when he's been at his best, he's done a lot of damage in the alley to right center field. A lot of damage. He's always got a smile on his face even when things aren't going well he's had a bigger smile on his face the last few days obviously he'd like to the team to be winning more but as Buck mentioned the confidence starting to come back for him. Trying to get him chase that high pass ball it was too high. But yeah it, it's all about confidence I don't care if you're a pitcher or a hitter you have to believe that. You're in a good spot. And you're not trying to hit everything and you're confident okay I'm swinging the bat well so I don't have to hit every pitch I see. I can wait and get a good one to hit. 2 2. Left field and Martinez is there Travis and the Blue Jays go in order again. To the bottom of the second no score at Fenway Park. Of the Blue Jays, Tay Oscar Hernandez. You said he spent a lot of one on one time with Hernandez last year at spring training when he was the bench coach for the World Series champion Houston Astros. Now, Cora said he's not at all surprised by the success Hernandez has found in the short time with the Blue Jays. He was one of the best athletes in camp. Hernandez didn't say a whole lot, but Cora told me they really clicked when they talked about baseball. Hernandez always wanted to be better, but what stood out to Cora was Hernandez's willingness to learn. Quote, when we traded him, it was a tough one. We knew what we were giving up. Hernandez told me he always asked Cora for advice. Hernandez said he'll never forget these words Cora always tried to hammer home. Quote, try to be you, try to work hard. When your chance comes, be ready for it. Don't throw it away. Sounds like pretty sound advice, Dan. All right, Hazel, thank you. Yes, and Alex Corp, of course, going on to be a big part of a member of the coaching staff as the Astros went on to win the World Series last year. And the Blue Jays, they've gotten some good returns out of that trade already with Teoscar Hernandez. And hoping that he continues to grow as a ball player. Rafael Devers moves up to the cleanup spot today for the Red Sox. No Mookie Betts, no Mitch Moreland, no Dustin Pedroia. Some of the regulars are out today. Pedroia just out, day game after night game, coming back from knee surgery. Just a day off for Mitch Moreland, and Mookie Betts still out with a bit of a side issue, and they're going to hold him out again today and hope he can play tomorrow night when Alex Cora goes back to Houston when the Red Sox are down there to take on the Astros in a four gamer starting tomorrow. And that's part of the reason that they have given some of their regulars the day off. They have a four game series. As Gavidio delivers another beautiful pitch right on the inside corner. A three pitch strikeout as he gets Devers looking. But Gavidio's got confidence and all he has to do is locate his pitches. And Bailey delivers a nice target and Gavidio hits the mark. This is the way he started his last outing against the Phillies. He retired the first eight in a row. A guy who's probably had to really prove himself to people because the stuff doesn't blow you away. Not overpowering with any particular pitch. I don't know if you want to call him an acquired taste because you got to see him a few times to say 
hey this isn't a fluke this is how this guy pitches and he can be successful this way. We had the same exact thoughts about Marco Estrada when he first came to Blue Jays. Remember he started pitching out of the bullpen just like a video. They said OK well he's a nice pitcher and then yeah OK and then he's got some starts and then he started putting things together and then he had two terrific seasons in 15 and 16. But they always have to prove themselves because they don't throw hard. I mean that's the first thing people look at nowadays. Well how hard does he throw. Well he throws 95. OK he's a good pitcher. No. These are good pitchers. The other guys are blessed with a good arm. These guys have to pitch and they've always had to pitch to earn their opportunities. Here's a ball hooked down the left field line but foul off the facing of that third deck. John Gibbons was asked before the game today. This is classic Gibby by the way. John Gibbons was asked before the game today. You know what do you think it's like when you try to pitch at Fenway for the first time and Gibby said I don't know I never pitched at Fenway. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yeah you, you should know that's the kind of answer you're going to get. What do you think it's yeah. like pitching. I don't know I yeah. never pitched. But he was being asked about Gavilio and he then went on to make a, a more serious point about Gavilio saying you know he looks relaxed he looks confident he doesn't worry about Gavilio getting nervous in certain ballparks or against certain lineups. He's got a pretty good feel about Gavilio's making now the ground ball. Solarte on the money two down. So five up five down so far for Gavilio he's going to face a guy now who has been a real thorn in the Blue Jays side this year. Yeah when you ask people OK who's killing the Blue Jays on the Red Sox this might not be the guy you think of first but Brock Holt in his seven games he's played against the Blue Jays 455 average his OPS is over one and he just comes up with key hits and you know what sometimes and I can speak as a former catcher sometimes you forget about going over Brock Holt because you got so many other good bats in the lineup you get down to him and say oh yeah we didn't talk about this guy. And by the end of the day he's got three hits he goes we're going to talk about him tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> he's at second base today with Pedroy out he's been in the outfield in this series as well. And he hits a ground ball back at first smokes got it and the Red Sox go in order again. Six up six down for Sam Gavilio so far today. Log in to My Blue Jays and enter the code NBJ0561 to earn My Blue Jays points just for watching this afternoon's broadcast. Your entry box can be found on your My Blue Jays homepage. Don't forget your code must be entered by 4 a.m. Dan. Thank you, Hazel. We go to the top of the third in this scoreless game. Six up, six down for both pitchers so far. Curtis Granderson batting in the seventh spot for the Blue Jays. A rare start against a left hander. Granderson is 2 for 12 against lefties this year. And overall hitting 242. After 
Granderson, Luke Maley, and then Gio Urshela, the bottom third of the lineup. Rodriguez locating pretty well in the early going as well. Yeah, he is really doing a good job, just like Gavilia, throwing a lot of strikes. And we always talk about it when pitchers throw strikes, hitters become anxious to swing. They know they can't be as selective, so they expand their zone. And that is strike three called, and Curtis knew it. The pitch tracker is brought to you by Coors Light, official beer. Of Major League Baseball. It's a pretty good sign for Eduardo Rodriguez. Yeah, it is. He's done a good job of filling up the strike zone. He threw eight pitches in the first inning. All pitches he threw in that first inning were strikes. Luke Maley, 0 and 1. Maley in his first real rut of the season. He got off to a great start. He's 0 for his last 16 right now and hitting 267 on the year. His third consecutive start behind the plate in this series. With Martin getting a start at left, a start at third, and Russell is not in the lineup today. After playing four straight games at four different positions, becoming just the third Blue Jay ever to do that. As Maley goes down on strikes two down. Bob Baylor did it back in 1978. Played left, center, right, and then third. And Marco Scudero did it in 2008 on cons in consecutive games. Scudero played left, short, first, and second. And with Russell Martin moving around the diamond, that means he made some work for somebody in the Blue Jays media relations staff to look up that nugget. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often, obviously, that you move players around. In four straight games. It's actually happened twice this year on other teams in the majors. Only twice ever for the Blue Jays before this year, but Whit Merrifield of the Royals and Ian Happ of the Cubs have also played four different positions in four consecutive games this year. Of course, when a primary catcher is the guy who does it, now you're really talking about yeah. something rare. Especially at 35 years old. A day off for Martin, day off for the team tomorrow in Detroit, and then the series begins against the Tigers on Friday. Gio Urshela at third base today. He's a lifetime 220 hitter. A couple of years with the Cleveland Indians. As Buck mentioned, is considered to be a very good defender at third base. Has never shown a whole lot with a bat. One two and it's off the outside corner with the knees. Yeah if you're a third baseman they want you to hit you have that's a hitting position it's like the corner outfielders uh, you play shortstop you can get by with it if you're a wizard with the glove but at third base and even at second base you've got to put up some offensive numbers and another grounder to short Bogarts on to first and once through the order Eduardo Rodriguez is perfect in fact there hasn't been a base runner either way in this game.
pitchers work from different sides of the pitching rubber. That's Rodriguez on the left. He works from the third base side and he throws across his body. Watch where he lands and he's still across his body, but it's a direct line to the outside corner to right handed hitters. Sam Gavillo on the right is on the first base side of the rubber. He steps in a more direct fashion toward home plate, toward the inside part of the plate to left handed hitters where he can get that sinking fastball. But it's interesting, they're both dramatically on the edges of the pitching rubber just to create a positive angle if you think of it like a golfer setting up for a drive it plays into the way you hit your ball and the way you shape your ball you're going to create the best angle to allow you to throw the most strikes and both of these guys have done it and you see the landing spots for Gavillo it's directly in front of him and a little more cross his body for Rodriguez and there's the first base run of the game as Blake Swihart lines one into center field for a base hit. Swihart's always been an interesting guy. He's a switch hitting catcher. That's how he came to the big leagues, and we have seen him play in the outfield. But they've always thought he was going to be an everyday player, and he still may be. But he doesn't have many at bats. That's just his 37th at bat of the season. And this is just his second overall start this year. And right now they're working him in or contemplating working him in a little bit in left, a little bit at first. Maybe a little bit behind the plate. They want to keep him around and see what he is. He's a guy who's had some injuries. With Hanley Ramirez being designated for assignment, that opens things up a little bit for Swihart to get more opportunities, especially at first base. I think the Red Sox would use him as a trade chip. I think he's that kind of player. He's a switch hitting catcher by trade. And if they have some needs, and there aren't many things that they really need. But they might use him at the trade deadline to bring a major league player back. So Gavillo will work from the stretch for the first time today. The batter was Christian Vasquez, the catcher, hitting 194. No score, bottom of the third. Here in the final game of this three game set. And another throw, very concerned with Swihart over there. Well, I would do, I would be concerned as well because I think they're going to play hit and run here with Vasquez. He's not hitting anything. And like we saw with Pedroia last night, Cora put the hit and run on with Pedroia at the plate just to get him going a little bit. Vasquez is hitting 194. And you got a decent runner at first in Swihart. Going. And a ground ball to third. Urshela across to first to get him. So as you said, they did play hit and run, did it on the very first pitch. And the end result is a runner at second with one out. Yeah, and I think that was a good call. Just trying to get Vasquez going a little bit, stay away from the double play. You start the runner, and you know what? Alex Cora can roll the dice right now. They've scored more runs than anybody in baseball, and they've got a comfortable lead in the East. They play great at home all season long, and why not gamble? You got your extra first baseman in there. Get him involved in the offense a bit. So a runner in scoring position with one down for the number nine hitter Jackie Bradley Jr. who is in right field today. Bradley hitting a buck 87 with a couple of homers. Salarte so trying to keep Swihart honest out at second. As Gavilio falls behind 1 0. We started to tell the story. People might wonder why would they take a center fielder as good as Bradley out of center field. It has to do. With J.D. Martinez being in the outfield, not DHing today, and when Alex Cora makes this decision at home, he wants Martinez in left because it's the smallest piece of ground to cover. The same reason why Russell Martin was in left instead of being in right. So they move Benintendi over to center field where he's perfectly capable, and they move Bradley from center over to right where he does very well. Kind of an embarrassment of riches, really, defensively for the Red Sox in the outfield. Especially when you factor Mookie Betts into the equation as well. When you play right field at Fenway Park, you might as well be standing at the 50 yard line trying to cover an entire football field. That's how much room you have out there. And you can see Teoscar Hernandez and how much ground he has to cover. And then you've got the added challenge of playing balls down that foul pole that bounce around and go straight away from the infield. It's a tough, tough outfield to play. One ball, two strikes, the count on Bradley with a runner at second and one down. 
good block there by Maley. He got low in a hurry on that one. Yeah, and you have to anticipate that. He had one go through the wickets in last night's game, a changeup that got underneath his glove. It was a wild pitch charge to Estrada, but you call for that breaking ball and you got to go down. He was very good at getting down on both knees and covering up the five hole with his glove. The 2 2. And that is a little bit high with a fastball. Now a full count on Bradley with the leadoff man, Andrew Benintendi, waiting in the on deck circle. Cavalio hasn't given up many hits in his. Time with the Blue Jays. They're hitting 186 against him. Lefty's hitting 192, and righty's hitting just 180 against him. So it's been kind of balanced. He's not concerned one or the other as far as you're going to get him out. 3 2, lifted in the air to left field. Going to back. Granderson got to play it off the wall. Swihart will round third and coming to score on an RBI double by Bradley, and the Red Sox lead 1 0. Granderson tried to decoy Swihart, who was running from second base. He threw his glove up as if he was going to have a play on it, going, oh, wow, it's halfway up the green monster. So Swihart picks up on it. The pitch just too much out over the plate. He was trying to get it inside, and Granderson plays it off the wall. By the time he picks up, all he has to do is get it back to the infield because Swihart scores easily. Now the top of the order coming up in Benintendi who grounded out his first time up. Gavilio had retired the first six in order but the first two innings on five ground outs and a strikeout. But has given up a single and a double in this inning as Boston takes the lead. So Larte stationed right behind the runner Bradley trying to keep his, him as close as he can out at second. Mentioned the alignment issue with Gavilio, and that pitch to Bradley was a good example of it. How he's trying to line himself up to the inside corner to left-handed hitters, but that ball got away from him and moved out over the plate to allow Bradley to hit it off the wall and left. He's working much more deliberately since the runners gotten on. And He's had to work from the stretch and maybe just considering each pitch a little more carefully now, but his pace has slowed down some. 1 1. Missed the outside corner. Pete Walker looking on. Been tough for him to try to work through all these issues that so many different pitchers seem to be having right now. Starting pitching thought to be a strength of this team coming in as this ball's lined into center. And that's a base hit to Pilar on a bounce, and it was hit so hard that Bradley will have to hold a third on the base hit by Benintendi. Benintendi is swinging the bat so well. It doesn't make any difference if he's facing a lefty or righty right now. He's hitting just about everything right off the barrel. Benintendi now is 5 for 12 in this series. Had a good series and it's this ball on the line. Pilar plays it on one hop, so Jackie Bradley Jr. has stopped it third. And Maley to the mound for a quick chat with Gavilio. Trying to cap the damage here this inning. A run in first and third, one out. And Xander Bogart's coming up. Bogart's grounded out to third in his first at bat today. See some folks still filing into the ballpark. Maybe some people worked in the morning and then came over here at lunch and not quite full here at Fenway. Before the game today, there were two or three thousand kids out of the bleachers. I don't know if it's a school thing or a camp thing or what it is, but they were here hours before the game, getting a presentation and all being involved and all kinds of things going out beyond the, the right center field. 
uh, bullpen area and it was loud. Yeah, it's a perfect day for that. That's for sure. And they were having a good time, and it was all orchestrated. They had some programs going on, and they started chants. It was pretty cool. Cavillo looking for a ground ball. Runner goes from first. Pitch taken for a strike. Throw down and safe at second is Ben Intendi on what looked like a very close play. John Gibbons had his right hand up, saying, "Hang on." Blue Jays want to consider whether they want to take a look at this one. Look, Bailey has been throwing the ball pretty well all season long, and the Red Sox, they have run a lot against the Blue Jays. They're not wasting any time. The Red Sox coming into this game 12 for 14 in steal attempts. And then Travis with a quick look to the bench, and boy, on that look, it looked like he got his hand in before he tagged it. It did. What you need to do is a defender here is go to the base. Don't go to the runner. Go to the base. He's got to come to you in that point. And Bailey said he's out. And Bailey wants to look at it. But if you're Devin Travis right there and the throw is on the money, go straight down to the base. That's where the runner's got to go to be safe. Don't try to tag him because as you saw, it looked like he tagged him on the shoulder right. while the hand was on the base. And that's the issue. Did the hand get in there before the tag came down? I couldn't tell from Travis's gesture whether he for sure thought the play was out or not. But the Blue Jays are going to have a look at this one. Call on the field is safe. Jordan Baker's the second base umpire. It was one of the, it's one of those in the old days. Ball beat the runner, he's out 100% yeah. of the time, yeah. right? And we'd like to welcome those of you back while we were having some difficulties we know you were watching the Red Sox feed welcome back to our coverage now the Blue Jays just asked for a review and got a call overturned as out at second is Andrew Benintendi yeah and it looked like the ball beat him obviously but and it looked like he may have avoided the tag but Benintendi didn't really extend until late watch how he reaches for it there and yeah, he got him before he put his hand on the glove. that's the view that they needed yeah. right there. So that's a big call that gets overturned in the Blue Jays' favor. Instead of second and third one out, it's runner with third two outs. And it's 0 1 on Bogarts. See how Bogarts has changed his approach right there. He was thinking about an off speed pitch and he was confident okay, if I get a fastball, I could fight it off and foul it off and stay alive. But in an RBI situation with two outs, I believe he's looking out over the plate. He's either going to take a fastball to ride or he's going to hit a breaking ball. He's got that in his mind that that's what he's got to do to drive this running. Gavilio way out in front 0 and 2. And the breaking ball sweeps down and away for ball one. Bogarts was on the DL earlier in the season when he slid into the visitors dugout at third base chasing the ball he flipped in that direction and fractured a bone in his ankle. But he came back quickly. We were talking during the break when Gavilio misses. He misses with a purpose. It's the breaking ball to the righty that's too far off the plate for them to chase. But how often since you've seen Gavilio this year. Have you seen him miss up in the strike zone? Yeah. Rarely, right? No, he, Rarely. he doesn't yeah. miss. He doesn't miss over the heart of the plate very yeah. often. Even I think the whole run he gave up to the pitcher, Zach Eflin, he meant to throw a strike, thinking I'll just get ahead of him and throw one down the middle, and Eflin hit it over the fence in center field. And again, with the stuff he's got, he knows he's got to live down in the zone for the most part. One, two. Down and away. This one gets away. Got a play. And safe is the call. Jerry Lane says that Bradley got his right arm around the tag attempt. And the Blue Jays may want to have a look at this one. The way Gavilio's reacting, though, I think he knows that he was safe. Yeah, he hasn't shown much reaction. The ball gets away from Maley. And then Luke kind of hesitates as he gets there and then didn't flip it right away. But Gavilio, he did exactly what he's supposed to do go to the plate. But 
he doesn't cover the outside part of the plate and the tag isn't applied until the hand is on home plate. But they've got to look at that. It's a run. Jackie Bradley Jr. with a good slide. For me, as the pitcher, you get there early enough. Now just drop your knee on that front part of the plate and tag him out. But well, he did touch him right there. You could see the laces of his glove and, move. And the, the laces are part of the glove. Yes. Right? The yes. laces are part of the glove. If they boy, look at oh that boy. replay, they're going to call him out. <laughs> if we can see that one more time, because his laces of his glove moved. Take a look at it once again. And watch how he reaches for Bradley. And then watch the laces of his glove. They definitely moved. And they have called him out. And the crowd is incensed because they may not have seen the laces or they may not know the laces are part of the glove but that is the rule. Blue Jays two for two on replays. app customize your experience to catch every moment this season get blue jays home screen icons and features such as the mlb tv game of the day pitch tracking in-game highlights live radio broadcasts stats news and more download mlb at bat today all right hazel thank you top of the fourth after a very unusual bottom of the third it's one to nothing red sox could have been a lot worse for the blue jays but they challenge two calls and both of them get overturned in their favor. And now the blue jays will try to get to work against Eduardo Rodriguez who's retired nine in a row to begin his afternoon. So that means top of the order Hernandez Pilar and Solarte. They overturned that second one quickly and they obviously saw what you saw right away that. The laces made contact with Bradley. It was a pretty good effort by Bradley to get around the tag, but the laces are part of the glove. Yeah, and, and Gavidia made a nice tag, but he barely got it. The laces is the only difference. And if the sun isn't shining on that part of the whole plate, who knows yeah. whether they see those laces or not? On the outside corner, one and two on Hernandez. If you weren't with us, Here's what happened. You can just the laces around the right wrist area of Bradley. And the crowd was not happy with the call. And a lot of people here in the ballpark, no doubt, are saying, what in the heck is going on here? How could he have been called out? They get a chance to see the replay up on the scoreboard here. But I doubt they were looking at or for the laces. They're just looking to see the, the, the meat part of the glove touch Bradley. Now can the Blue Jays get some offense going? Not Hernandez as he strikes out for the second time. The Honda Checkered Flag event is back. Hurry in to grab the Civic that matches your game. Dan Schulman, Buck Martinez, and Hazel May here in Boston. 
Wrapping up this three game set, Kevin Pillar up for the Blue Jays. Lifted a fly ball to right field his first time up. And this time he sends a ball to deeper right field, but still lots of room out there for Bradley to make the catch. Two down. Pillar continues to square up the baseball quite often. But Rodriguez, he's not made too many pitches out over the plate. All the pitches he's thrown so far, he's been able to keep them out of the middle. And when Blue Jays do make contact, it's really not a very aggressive swing because they're reaching for pitches. Jan Hervis Solarte hit a soft liner to second his first time up. And taking one all the way as he does on occasion, he looks at a strike. When the Red Sox made the trade and sent Andrew Miller to Baltimore, Eduardo Rodriguez was in Double A buoy. He had made 16 starts at that point. He was three and seven with a 4.79 in run average. For me, that's really doing your job as a scout. I mean, anybody can see it if a guy's 11 and two in the first half of the season. He's got a 2.00 ERA. And you go, oh, we want that guy. But when you go down and look at a minor leaguer in double A and say OK what's so impressive about a three and seven pitcher stuff and it was just a one for one deal for Andrew one Miller for, one. Yep. for a big time reliever obviously one of the best relievers in the game and Andrew Miller although he's taken his career to new heights since that trade backhanded by Bogarts again very calmly sets his feet throws out Solarte and Eduardo Rodriguez has retired all 12 Blue Jays he's faced. But you can see the team the Blue Jays will be playing next as the Tigers host the Angels tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock Eastern. Andrew Heaney for the Angels and Ryan Carpenter for Detroit. We know the Blue Jays will be sending Garcia Happen Sanchez to the mound over the weekend against the Tigers. It looks like Blaine Hardy is the Friday starter for Detroit against the Blue Jays. Matt Boyd, the former Blue Jay, looks in line to start on Saturday. Could be Michael Fulmer on Sunday. Both Hami Garcia and Jay Happ were great in their last outings. Both against Philly, so hopefully they'll be able to do that again. Here's Andrew Bogarts, who was up for the vast majority of the bottom of the third inning <laughs> with all this stuff going on out of the bases and the calls getting overturned. And of course, his never at bat never his at bat never got resolved, so. He's back up there to lead off the bottom of the fourth. He'll be followed by J.D. Martinez and then Rafael Devers. We mentioned this is the first start for Sam Gavillo here in this ballpark. He actually came here last year as a member of the Seattle Mariners. 
They were on an eight game road trip. They started in Washington. Gavidio took a loss in Washington in game two of that road trip. Then he came here to Fenway. He wasn't scheduled to start. They went to Colorado and he picked up his first big league win on May 29th against the Rockies. You know, he sat here and he said, Oh, Fenway Park, that looks like a tough place to pitch. And then he got to the Rockies, Coors Field. <laughs> But he won his first big league game out there against the Rockies last May 29th. And there's the changeup. You can see the bottom fall out of it as he gets Bogarts. I got a question for you. Probably a question that shouldn't be asked because who knows what the timetable is. But at some point, Marcus Stroman's going to ramp up a throwing program. And presumably, at some point, Marcus Stroman's going to be back. It's not going to be next week or anything. Obviously, you got to build up arm strength again. But, you know, say Stroman is back in three or four weeks. I mean, say Gavilio keeps doing this. Then what? Yeah, that's a tough question. And, you know, that's why you never make decisions until you have to. Right. Which is why I shouldn't have asked the question. No, but it's a good <laughs> question. I mean, it, it's right. But for a manager, I think that's what managers always think about. People say, well, what are you going to do when this guy's back? Well, he's not back. So I don't have to make that decision now. Because from one week to the next, we have seen it with hitters all season long. You know, you could barely get to ask Hernandez out when he first got here. Now it's a different story. So you don't make those decisions until you absolutely have to. And they always used to ask me as a manager, well, what are you going to do when that guy comes back? Well, he's not back yet. We don't have to make up that decision. And, and we know how quickly injuries crop up. Right. Something else could Lack of yeah. performance and yeah. maybe a trade by then. We're almost in June now and you know that trade deadline is going to get here before you know it and we've already seen a major trade in my mind the Alex Colomay trade to Seattle and I think teams that especially I think the National League teams with so many teams in the hunt they're going to start thinking about who they can add who they can trade for to improve their chances of making the postseason. And you look at the starting rotation and obviously collectively it's been a struggle not for all of these guys. You know, Jay Happ's doing great. That's him right in the middle of the screen with uh, Sanchez and Estrada to his left. There's Garcia to Happ's right. There's only so many spots. Another strikeout for Gavilio as he gets J.D. Martinez on another pitch down just below the knees. But if Gavilio keeps pitching well when a team is struggling like this team is struggling. He's not coming he's out. He's not coming out. And he continues to make pitches like this. He's going to pitch well. I mean, that's a great example of how good his slider is. You get one of the best hitters in baseball in J.D. Martinez to chase that slider with two strikes. It looks like a fastball coming out of his hand. It starts over the plate and breaks off the plate down and away. Here's Devers. Abilio. Stumbling a little bit, but we'll make the play on the smoke. And that's a one, two, three inning with a couple of strikeouts. Time now for a Blue Jay Central update. Jamie Campbell and Joe Siddler in the Samsung Broadcast Studio.
First 20,000 fans will receive a solar-powered Marcus Stromi shimmy wobble bobble. That's when the New York Yankees take on your Toronto Blue Jays at 7.07 p.m. Eastern. For tickets, as always, visit BlueJays.com. Haven't you always wanted a Marcus Stroman shimmy wobble bobble, Dan? I can't even say it. A Marcus Stroman. <laughs> what was after that? Shimmy wobble bobble. Shimmy wobble bobble. <laughs> Top of the fifth. And it's one to nothing. For the Red Sox over the Blue Jays. Smoke, Morales, and Travis. Smoke hits one off the end of the bat. Pass them out. Out to second. And Holt will make the play. That's 13 in a row set down by Rodriguez so far today. Yeah, and both of these guys have done a great job, and it shows you the art of pitching. We talked about that at the start of the show. Neither one of them are going to really excite you with flat out stuff. But boy, they're doing a good job of locating their pitches very well. How many times have we seen a Blue Jay hitter reach for a ball, whether it's inside or try to chase a ball up or down? But Rodriguez has stayed out of the middle for the most part. Andres Morales with a ground ball to short his first time up. I think the Morales grounder to short and Pilar's second fly ball to right. The only two balls probably hit with pretty good contact so far today. Talking to him, talking to himself a little bit about his mechanics and his follow through there. As he readies himself for another pitch to Morales. This is low ball two. Well, the Blue Jays on Saturday in Philadelphia didn't get a hit until the seventh inning. With two outs, Russell Martin had an RBI single off Aaron Nolan. Of course, earlier this month they were no hit by James Paxton. This reflects on the offensive struggles of this team. Three and one on Morales. For Jacoby, we talked about Pete Walker and you know, the difficulty he's had as he keeps trying to work through the pitching issues. Brooke Jacoby is trying to do the same thing. You see him alongside quality control coach Mike Mordecai. And you see it, I see it, and anybody that's around the ball club sees how much time these coaches put into their trade. Obviously, every hitter. You have concerns about. You look at what he's doing at the plate. You look at his video. Then you try to match him up against the opposing pitcher. You sit down. You talk to the hitters. You try to give them a game plan that's going to work for them and get them turned around. I mean, all these coaches are agonizing over the way this team is yeah, played. They really are. Three, two, weekly hit up the third baseline and foul by the time Devers can get there. And I think that's a great point you made. The coaches, it wears on them. They, they're. You know, we get a chance to talk to them, whether it's hotel, ballpark, wherever it is. And uh, Gibby and the coaches, I mean, they're lifers. They're, they've been in the game 30, 35, 40 years, some of these guys. And they spent hours and hours and hours. Seven o'clock game. Most of them are here six, seven hours before the game. Video, extra work, whatever it takes. Yeah, and they will talk to each other, too, about it. Hey, Louie, what do you see? You see anything in the outfield? Mordecai and Jacoby Ellsbury. Jacoby Ellsbury. Brooke Jacoby are talking about it all the time. Hey, what do you see with this guy's approach? You know, Mordecai's in his first year with this ball club in a big league level, but he's a longtime major league player and a coach, and he understands that, you know, you don't see everything that you're looking at. And there's the first hit of the day. Morales lines one into center field. So after Rodriguez retires 13 in a row, Morales reaches on a base hit. Well, he's 10 for his last 25 now, and that's been a real bright spot for this ball club in an otherwise disappointing month. The fact that Morales is starting to come around with the bat. Left side, right side, doesn't make any difference, and he has hit the ball hard throughout this series. So a base runner for the Blue Jays with a one down here in the fifth, and here's Devin Travis, who hit a fly ball to left field his first time up. Pops it out of play, right side. When you're trying to hit the ball to the power alley in right center, if you're Devin Travis, you got to make sure you stay on top of the ball. 
you cannot allow that barrel to dip underneath your hands or you're going to hit pop ups and lazy fly balls to right field. You want to keep your hands on top of the ball and line it into right field drive it with authority to the opposite side. He does that really well. But you got to make sure you don't drop the barrel and allow it to get below your hands. Chase the ball low and it's 0 and 2. With some of the changes in the lineup and with Travis swinging the bat better the last few days, he's up to the sixth spot in the lineup. Granderson down to seven. That has to do with the lefty being on the mound. Then you've got Maley eight, and Urshela is in there at third base today, so he's batting ninth. Travis actually hit leadoff to start the season. He's in the top spot in the order. Appeared in five games batting in the leadoff spot early in the year. In and out of the mid of Vasquez unhappy with himself that he couldn't squeeze it. That would have been an out. Well, you mentioned it and talked about it a little bit. Vasquez has not had the kind of season behind the plate that he would like, and he's had problems at the plate. He's hitting under 200. But he's committed three years. He's caught just four of 16 base dealers, and we saw him whiff on one of the first pitches of the ball game and hit the umpire right in the kneecap. One nothing Red Sox, top five. And the one two to Travis. And saw that one. You can see the two pitches. Almost identical locations. He swung at the first one that he saw down there, but he took that one. Picked it up earlier. Two balls, two strikes. Two two. And it's inside a full count. Granderson waiting on deck. Morales, the first base runner of the afternoon for the Blue Jays. He's camped at first with a full count on Travis and one down. He is running. Strike three and an easy strike him out, throw him out. Man. Travis still discussing it with Jerry Lane at home plate. He thought it was ball four. They were counting on Travis putting the ball in play. He wound up taking strike three. Double play, inning over. Thing is, we welcome you back to Fenway Park, Boston. Coming up at the bottom of the fifth, and again, has some technical difficulties. We understand in the top half of the inning, so we uh, thank you for bearing with us. Well, everybody on our end is hard at work trying to fix them. We understand you're back with us now, and hopefully, it stays that way the rest of the afternoon. Blue Jays ending the top of the fifth with a strikeout, throw them out, double play. 
And now Sam Gaviglio back to work bottom five to face Eduardo Nunez, Brock Holt, and Blake Swihart. Four more innings today for Gaviglio thus far. A run on three hits, and he has not walked a batter. And that keeps that's in line with what he's been doing ever since he got to the Blue Jays. High fly ball to left field. Granderson's going to turn, and it'll be caught. And the signal on the field is home run for Eduardo Nunez. And John Gibbons already up on the top step, wondering if that fan reached over the yellow line, reached out to make that catch. And he's asking the umpires to take a look at it. If he's right in the hot hand, he's two for two on replays today. And this will be an interesting one. Well, there is a bench up on top of the great monster. It's about 12 inches, 15 inches wide. And the fans have a little railing. That they have to reach over. You see how wide that bench is, and that was a home run. There's no question about it. And he makes the catch. He leans out over it, but it was going to hit on top of that green monster, even yep. if he wasn't there. So this is going to be a home run. And you can see how wide that top of the green monster is. It's probably a foot and a half, two feet wide. And then there's a railing that's about eight inches tall. And I think that helps the umpires as well because when it hits up against that railing, it'll tear them back. And, and take an awkward bounce. And it's a quick one. The umpires have a look, or New York has a look, and it is a home run for Nunez to make it a two to nothing lead for Boston. They really tapped into something promotionally here in Boston when somebody, when whoever it was, said, Hey, why don't we put seats up on top of that green monster? I don't know, 15 years ago, maybe? Yeah, I don't know if probably. It's that many years, but. but it's, uh, yeah, it's a terrific. Vantage point to be up there and be able to look down on the field from an angle that not many people have around baseball. Of course, there are so few of those seats. I don't know what the number is. I think it's around 250 or 300 seats or something like that. And uh, they go for big bucks, especially on the secondary market. You ever been up there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's cool, though. Oh, yeah. Well, we actually did an open from the top of those seats. It wasn't quite like being on the top of the kingdom, but it was good. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> Two and one, the count on Brock Holt. Buck and I climbed up uh, a ladder on the kind of the inside of the wall near the top of the kingdom. It opened a hatch like we were in a submarine, got on top of the roof, <laughs> and then had to climb up on the roof for a long way. As Holt hits a fly ball to deep right, but playable for Hernandez. Remember, there was kind of a ladder on the outside as we're scaling up before we get to the flat rooftop of the kingdom. And I remember whoever was with us, whoever the local person from Seattle was with us, said, yeah, it's not so bad when you climb up the ladder, but when you're coming down, you can see the whole city below you. That's the scary part. Yeah, it's like you're yeah. walking off the edge of the earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we went up there so we could look into the construction site of the new golf field. That's yeah. right. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Blake Swihart singled and scored back in the third. Two nothing Red Sox now. Bottom of the fifth. You know, I went online, did a little research about the Green Monster seats. Three hundred and seventy dollars for a ticket to see the June 9th game against the White Sox. That's like one seat. It's in row one. Is that the secondary market or? No, this is online. Really? Yeah. Boston, official site of the Boston Red Sox. 370, 315, 320, 305. Standing room on the Green Monster, $100. But it's a great vantage point. Yeah. I don't know if they have, like, weight service. You know whether they bring you food and drink out there as well, but I know they have concessions not far away. But yeah. I mean, look at that. They're sitting right there. They got a little counter they can lean against. You're out in the sunshine. It's perfect. They really have done a great job here and at Wrigley. And maybe no coincidence that Theo Epstein was the president here and is now the president there. But updating these ballparks, adding more modern amenities, adding more seats. 
without in my opinion taking away from any of the history and nostalgia tradition of, of either ball. Now they have kept the footprint of the yeah. playing field and I think that's what's important. Let it go. Yeah. The only chance yeah. you have. How about that? A base hit for Swihart. Couldn't have done it better if he tried. That's the best wedge shot he's ever made. <laughs> Check, swing, tapper off the plate. Swihart's getting a start at first base, and he's two for two. He got the first hit off of Gavilio to lead off the third. Came around to score, and here is a check swing roller into the shift, and nobody's got a chance to make a play. And Gavilio just hoped that it would go foul, but it was clearly going to stay fair. So here's Vasquez with a runner at first and one out, and a run in on the home run by Nunez. Vasquez grounded out his first time up. Carlos Fabulous, the third base coach. Just a 193 average, does not have a home run. Look around baseball, the Blue Jays have a couple of guys under 200, but it's much more common than it was a few years ago. Batting averages are going down. Slugging is going up, but batting averages are going down. I saw the other day, I can't remember what team it is, might be the Red Sox, but that the highest team batting average in baseball is 264. You always had teams hitting 275, 280, that sort of thing. Yeah, I and mean, everybody talks about it, it's velocity, but I think more than anything, it has to do with the hitter's approach. I mean, they're not afraid to strike out. You're not penalized for striking out. And nobody's making any adjustments to counteract the shifts. So well, it's really, you know, kind of a combination of things. Joe Siddle and Kevin Barker were talking in the studio about the shift and Kevin especially there's a pitch out that's a, that's another thing that's almost a relic in today's game you hardly ever see pitch outs because teams don't run as much anymore but the Blue Jays wary of how much the Red Sox have run on them in the last couple of years Kevin and Joe were talking about the shift and Kevin specifically says he is in favor of outlawing the shift because he thinks the shift is the main reason that Hitters have nowhere to go but over the shift. So they're trying to lift the ball, more swing and miss, games take longer, more strikeouts, fewer balls in play. He said, if you want more balls in play and if you want quicker games, get rid of the shift. I don't agree with that at all. And we were talking to Mike Sosha about this too, and he was you asked him about expanding rosters to make it easier. I think what you're doing is you're just giving in to the inability of hitters to make adjustments. And, and I think this generation of hitters and all these guys have all learned how to hit with aluminum bats. And they're swinging from their heels. They're just thinking about hitting the home runs. And like I said, the game has not penalized the strikeout. This could be a tricky play. Draws three Blue Jays, but it'll be Travis who gets there in time for the second out. Speaking of the studio, Jamie's got an update. Well, and you get the feeling that Cleveland's eventually going to put it together. I mean, they obviously haven't had the kind of season that they would like, but they still appear to be the class of the American League Central, a division where it certainly looks like only one team is going to be able to qualify for the playoffs. But the the Indians have won four in a row now. They're starting to put a little distance between themselves and everybody else. Edwin and Connor starting to swing the bat well. Michael Brantley's had a terrific season, hitting the ball all over the place, and Jose Ramirez might be their most valuable player. They have concerns in their bullpen, and yeah. you can bet they're trying to address that. You know, not only is Jose Ramirez great, but he's a switch hitter, which makes him more valuable, and he can play second and third, which makes him more valuable. And you could put him other spots if you had to. Put him out in left field. And teams are just craving those versatile kind of players because they're the benches are so small. Solarte on the right side of the infield ranges to his left and makes a good play to get Bradley and that's all. But a run on the Nunez homer and at the end of five it's now two to nothing Red Sox.
quick update on Josh Donaldson. He's sitting out for the second straight game, still tending to that tightness in his left calf. Now, Donaldson will likely be in the lineup Friday in Detroit, according to manager John Gibbons. When asked whether Donaldson was available to pinch hit today, Gibbons said highly unlikely, but you never know. Gibbons said that Donaldson wanted to pinch hit last night, so he wouldn't be surprised in the very least, Dan, if Donaldson tries to get into this ball game this afternoon. Always a possibility, but teams uh, so often they want to err on the side of caution, and with an off day tomorrow, you almost always see the team wait that extra day and hope the player is ready to go after that. So, hoping to see Donaldson back in there Friday night in Detroit. Josh came out before the start of this game and threw, played some catch, moved around, got out on the field. Neither team hit today. The only buddy, the only person I saw that was active on the field was Blake Swihart. He was taking some ground balls from first base. Curtis Granderson leading off the sixth. He'll be followed by Luke Maley and then Gio Urshela. And again, and, and this is not to say that injuries are the sole cause of why the team is struggling, because they are not, but they are certainly a cause. But if you think of, say, the 13 position players who would have been on the team on opening day had everybody been healthy. Josh Donaldson has been on the DL and now is out again. Troy Tulowitzki, Aledmus Diaz would have been on the team as, as the, and he's on the DL right now. Randall Grichik, Steve Pearson. So five of them of the 13 are either on the DL or have been on the DL. And one of your five starting pitchers. Yeah. Marcus Stroman. And the closers on it, and Rob Roberto as soon as on administrative leave. Now then, in addition to that, you've got other guys who have been healthy, but just haven't gotten anywhere close to even typical career numbers. The Blue Jays have lost 14 of 20 since Osuna was placed on that restricted list. Other guys have had to pitch out of the bullpen and rules they're not accustomed to, and it's just created problems. But you're right, it's not one thing that has led to this bad record in the month of May. And again that's not to say injuries are the only cause because there are a lot of guys who have not come close to doing what they've done in the past and that's a big part of it as well. But there's no doubt that the injuries have contributed. It's why Martin's moved around the field. It's why Solarte is in short. It's why Solarte is the number three hitter on this team right now. Ooh, that is three four five inches off the outside corner but it's strikeout number six for Rodriguez. See big at the outdoor living event at Home Hardware on from May 16th to June 5th. Here's how. Yeah, that's a tough one right there. It was a cutter away from Granderson, and he's rung up on that pitch. Luke Maley lifts a fly ball into right center field. Jogging in to make the play is Bradley two down. When I watch Jackie Bradley Jr., he reminds me an awful lot of DeWan White in the outfield, the way he just coasts the balls. He has so much confidence in his ability to read how far the ball's going to carry. He will run to spots like Devo and then turn around and put his glove up. Like, okay, come to me. Now he made a Fine catch robbing Morales of extra bases here two nights ago. Gio Urshello, the batter, and he looks at a strike. Rodriguez has faced the minimum today because the one Blue Jay who reached base, Kendrys Morales, was then thrown out trying to steal on a strike him out, throw him out double play when Devin Travis took strike three called on a 3 2 pitch. Blue Jays elected to start the runner. Travis took strike three. Now Jerry Lane got hit again and is shaken up. That time on a foul ball. Yeah, it looked like he got hit right over the collarbone. And he took a shot off his right knee early in the game. And the training staff, obviously, both of the Team's trainers are always aware that the umpires might need some of their assistance, but that really hit him hard. You know, they 
umpires they work in that slot you can see it hit him basically right over his heart and they work in that slot and they become very vulnerable to those foul balls and you know what years ago the umpires used to use the big balloon protector and yeah it wasn't very cool and it was kind of awkward to handle but boy it protected you from these types of shots. Boy, directly into that chest protector right over his heart. He's had a rough day back he there. He really has, but shakes it off, says he's okay, and back behind the plate. Points to Rodriguez. And the 0-2 pitch on the way to Urshela. Rounded out his first time up. Rodriguez has hit 74 pitches right now, 54 of them strikes. He has six strikeouts, has not walked a batter, has given up just one hit. And look at that. Can't do a whole lot better than that, obviously. Nope. Yeah, and he really set the tone early in this ballgame. In his first inning, he was eight for eight in throwing strikes. And then once you establish that, the hitters. Get a little anxious and they'll swing at some borderline pitches and they'll help you out from time to time. If you go out there throwing balls consistently, they're going to make you work and then they'll make you work into a mistake. Just inside, two and two on Urshela. Stairs now full count. If Rochella can get aboard, it'll be Teoscar Hernandez who struck out both advance today. Three two. And it's ball four outside as Rochella works him for a walk. Just the second base run to reach base for the Blue Jays. Dan Mets Morales had a single in the fifth inning, and now Rochelle draws a two on walk. Alex Cora looking on. A guy who was, a, for the most part, a utility infielder in his career, left handed batter, but a, you know, a good, smart, tough player, good teammate, worked hard. You know, bounced around to a, a few different teams, played different positions, did whatever was asked for him. And I think a guy, Buck, that when you heard, oh, Alex Cora is starting to interview for managerial jobs, I don't think that really surprised anybody. No, I, I agree with you 100%. He and his brother Joey, both long careers as players, and Joey's a coach now with the Pittsburgh Pirates, but they both were very, very good baseball people. They worked at the game. Alex Cora went to the University of Miami to play baseball, and Joey Cora went to Vanderbilt. So they were both in great baseball programs as college. Puerto and Rico natives. Yep. Alex came up with the Dodgers in '98 as a 22 year old. He spent seven years with the Dodgers. Then he started to move around a bit. He was here for four seasons with the Red Sox. Hernandez, high drive, left field, and gone. Teoscar Hernandez ties the game with a two run homer. A two out walk and one swing of the bat, and it's a brand new ball game. The Blue Jays have only had three base runners, and two of them have come in this inning. Rochella worked the walk. He had took a pitch outside for ball four, and then that set the table for Teoscar Hernandez. He connects for his eighth home run of the season, and just like that, it's a 2 2 game. 
Number nine hitter gets on that changes the complexion of the whole inning. Evan Pilar looks at a strike. Hernandez had been struggling recently but that pitch is up and it got just too much of the plate. They mentioned how Rodriguez has been able to keep it to the edges but that one got a little bit too much of the outer half. Beauty of Fenway Park if you're a hitter you hit a fly ball and it didn't take much to hit it into the green monster seats. When you hit balls like that the only thing you hope for is that it's high enough. You know you've hit it hard enough but it's a matter of whether it'll clear that 37 foot fence in left. Which is allegedly 310 feet down the left field line. <laughs> <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. It's not very far. Again the 0 2. Pilar bounces it foul. Yeah I can tell you as a young player I used to pace it off from home plate from time to time just to see what it was and it would vary they have moved home plate a couple of times and they've changed the configuration a little bit the seats behind home plate never used to reach onto the field as they do now the seats behind home plate used to be parallel to the front edge of the dugouts. So they've added about three rows of seats that have crept onto the field. Let's see where the edge of the dugout is. All of those seats to the left of that front edge of the dugout are new. Did you like hitting here? Oh yeah. I did. I was a pull hitter and I actually had my only two home run game of my career here. I think I hit about 280 in this ballpark. You hit 283 with three homers in this ballpark. Yeah, I hit one home run in 76 off Tom Murphy. It was funny, all the home runs I hit came off right handed pitchers. Swing and a miss, and Pilar is gone to end the top of the six, but the Blue Jays do tie it. Hasn't been a whole lot to smile about here in Boston for the Blue Jays, but Hernandez with a two run shot. Today's ball game is on pace for a 21 home run season. Mookie Betts for 50. Two guys with pretty big numbers who do not have big bodies. Quality control coach Mike Mordecai isn't a big guy either and told me he's not surprised these Red Sox hitters can generate so much power for their size. A lot of guys today are extremely flexible. They can put their bodies in different positions and create that torque and explosiveness in short powerful swings. When Mordecai played he said players had flexibility issues. They relied heavily on weights. It used to be if you were a smaller guy with average or above average speed they wanted you to hit the ball on the ground and take advantage of your speed now because of shifts Mordecai says those ground balls are caught more so they want you now to get the ball up in the air strength and conditioning Dan are not like they were back in the day guys are stronger you don't need to look like Aaron Judge to be a power hitter in today's game. Well, this isn't Jose Altuve a perfect example of that he might be five six probably closer to five five. And he's developed a lot of power in the last couple of years and is about as good a player as there is in the game. Man, 
Andrew Benintendi is going to have himself one heck of a long productive career. He's a good ball player. Benintendi with a second hit of the afternoon, and boy, he's got a good swing. He just hits the ball where it's pitched. Nice and easy stroke, well balanced at the plate, and he picks up his second single of the afternoon. Six hits in the series. So the Blue Jays tie it up, and the Red Sox get the leadoff man on here with the bottom of the sixth. And this was one of the themes in last night's game. Every time the Blue Jays cut into the deficit, they gave something back the next half inning. Bogart shows bunt and pops it up, and Maley will make the play. Well, that's a big break for the Blue Jays, of course, when you get an out. Bogarts, I don't think he was sacrificing. I think he was trying to drop a bunt down the third baseline, but he pops it up. Maley's able to make a play on the first out of the inning. Urshela was deep at third. I think Bogarts was just trying to catch him off guard, and he pops it up. Huge first out. So now J.D. Martinez, who has grounded out and struck out, very hot coming into this game. 12 home runs in his last 25 games. As Xian Juan Oh is now up in the Blue Jay bullpen. Sam Gavilio in his first start with the Blue Jays, five and a third, didn't give up a run against Oakland. In his second start, six innings, three runs on just three hits against Philadelphia. Now working into the sixth inning here at Fenway Park against the Red Sox. Three consecutive solid outings to say the least for Gavilia. He's been very efficient in his first two outings. When you look at what he has done in this outing it's the same way. I mean, he's thrown a lot of strikes. He's using all of his pitches. Two runs on six hits through five innings. And now it's a tie game. I think he has to make sure that he keeps the ball on the edges to J.D. Martinez. Martinez is very good out over the plate, outer half of the plate. He's got a lot of power. We talked about his opposite field power. Breaking ball misses outside. That's the pitch that. Martinez struck out on in the fourth inning. That slider they chased away. Ilya wants a new baseball. Ilya's done a really nice job against the two, three, four hitters today. Bogarts, Martinez, and Devers are 0 for 7 with three strikeouts. Got hurt by Bradley with an RBI double off the Green Monster back in the third, and then by Nunez with a solo homer to lead off the fifth. And again, the pitch count very efficient. He hasn't walked anybody. Granderson never even moved. Martinez with his 13th home run in the last 26 games, and Boston's got the lead back. That's what they brought J.D. Martinez here for. The ability to change a game with one swing of the bat. They were missing it last year, and he has provided that kind of damage to this Red Sox ball club. He was over two with a man at first and one out, and he just crushed that ball. 18th of the season. RBIs number 46 and 47. Two seam fastball, and it just doesn't move much. You can see where it is on the barrel of the bat. He barreled it up, and it was way over the green monster seats. Very powerful stroke, and he's not a big hulking man, but boy, he gets a lot of bat speed, and that ball was crushed. Just heard Hazel talking about the little guys that can swing the bat, and He's one of those big guys that can swing the bat. 0 2 to Devers. Oh, 
O is continuing to throw, so it looks like even though the Blue Jays are now trailing, that since John Gibbons got him up, he'll get him in and get an off day tomorrow. They don't have to be as concerned about guys being overused heading into the weekend series. It's interesting that Travis isn't deeper than he is right now with the shift on. This is kind of the way you see an alignment when there's a runner at first and they're thinking about turning a double play. Usually that second baseman is way out on the outfield grass. Devers isn't a, a real speedster or anything like that. Cuts down Travis's range. Yeah, it's really interesting. You're right. And when you see them play against Smoke, for instance, he's much deeper in the outfield. Their second baseman would play many yards into the outfield, but Devin. For some reason, I'm not sure why he would play that close. If Devers hits it in his direction, he's going to hit it hard. It'll get to you quickly. Three two. And a swing and a miss to get him two down. When David Ortiz retired from the Boston Red Sox, there was a big void in the power department. Last year, they were last with home runs at 168, so they went out and brought in JD Martinez. And hence the All Star break last year, he's at 49 home runs, driven in almost 120 runs. He's first in home runs, RBIs, extra base hits, and OPS since the All Star break last season. He had a great finish with the Diamondbacks. There was a chance he was going to resign with Arizona, but Boston signed him late in the offseason, and he has been exactly what they had hoped for, maybe even more, given his batting average. Nunez homered his last time up. 4 2 Red Sox lead now in the bottom of the sixth, looking for a sweep. He's also grounded out. Home run was his fourth of the season. And he hits a ground ball to short. Big hop for Solarte, and that's all. But it's a damaging inning. The Blue Jays get two in the top half to tie it. And then Martinez comes back and restores the two run lead for the Red Sox with his 18th home run of the season. Baseball partnership and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Rogers Blue Jays baseball partnership. To the seventh at Fenway Red Sox four, Blue Jays two. Jan Hervas Solarte facing Eduardo Rodriguez. First pitch swinging a pop up right in the middle of the infield. It'll be Devers giving way to Bogarts for out number one. I know for sure is Rodriguez wanted nothing to do with that one. He no. was pointing as much as he could point. You got it. You got it. Yeah. 
And then the priority is for the shortstop on those pop ups. So Solarte's 0 for 3. Just two hits today for the Blue Jays. A single for Morales and a home run for Hernandez. Justin Smokes grounded out twice. Blue Jays have only had 16 hits in the three games. Seven in each of the first two games. As mentioned, they're playing the team with the best record of baseball, and this is just the third time in the 118 year history of the Red Sox that they have started a year at least 38 and 17. They had this identical record, 38 and 17, back in 2002. And in 1946, they were 42 and 13. So Alex Cora has this team up to one of the best starts this franchise has ever had. And a chance to break out a Ted Williams, Bobby Doerr photograph of the 1946 Red Sox. Yeah, they had a bunch of great players, obviously. And both of those guys ended up in the Hall of Fame. How did Ted Williams hit the ball as far as he like I mean he was a tall guy especially for his era but like look at his arms compared to the arms of a modern slug. Yeah you know what I mean that's what they called him the splendid splinter. And he had a lot of torque in his swing. He could really generate a lot of bat speed. He had 38 home runs in 46. A terrific hitter probably one of the smartest hitters that's ever played the game. Of course, he uh, he wrote a book, The Science of Hitting, that many many players bought, kept, carry around, dog ear it, highlight it, circle it. I mean, he's got some great theories in there that modern players still read and put to use. Uh, I, I think a, a lot of baseball fans know this, but for fans who don't, Ted Williams missed a lot of time serving in the military in two different wars. World War Two in the Korean War. So 1942 he wins the batting title. He hits 356 with 36 homers. Misses the next three years. Comes back and in his first year back it's 342 with 38 homers. Like didn't miss a beat. There's a line over to left center field a base hit for smoke. A one out single. The 2018 Civic Type R, like no Honda you've ever seen. He's so good, he got a statue here in Boston. Why not? As good a hitter, one of the best hitters, certainly, who ever played the game. So he comes back from World War II, just starts winning batting titles again, leading the league in RBIs, having a great years, and then he leaves again for more military duty in the early 50s. Barely plays in 52, barely plays in 53. And in 1954, his first full year back, as a 35 year old, he hits 345 and leads the league in both on base percentage and slugging. You know, his career on base percentage, 482. Career on base percentage. Yeah, he just knew how to hit. He loved to hit. That year you're talking about 54, he led the league in RBIs, drove in 136 runs. It's hard to fathom that they didn't win more than they did with yeah. him and the players they had around him. They had some good teams. But of course, during that time, the Yankees had those terrific teams that were consistently winning. Morales pops it up. Bogart's back in the outfield grass, two down. Yeah, the Yankees won five in a row, right? 49 through 53. They had that DiMaggio guy for some of those years. Then they had that Mantle guy at the beginning of his career. Yogi Berra was in there as well. Alex Cora is on his way to the mound. DiMaggio's last year, Mantle's first year, right? 1951, right. I believe. So that's a nice way to transition. Eduardo Rodriguez. And a little pat on the head from Alex Cora. Six and two thirds, really strong innings. And a big ovation from the Fenway faithful. Very good outing for him, and he leaves with the lead.
has come out of the bullpen for Boston after a very strong six and two thirds six and two thirds innings excuse me from Eduardo Rodriguez Barnes inherits a one on a two out situation and Devin Travis coming to the plate. Now Barnes hasn't pitched since Friday against the Atlanta Braves and he has pitched very well he is a guy that will pitch in the middle six seventh eighth inning then they'll go to Joe Kelly in the eighth inning and Kimberl in the ninth inning they've got a good back end of their bullpen. But Barnes he has a lot of run in his last seven appearances and 18 of his 22 games prior to this one have been scoreless. Travis the tying run with two down here in the seventh smokes at first Travis a fly ball and a strikeout today. Blue Jays tied it in the top of the sixth on a Teoscar Hernandez home run. Red Sox got the lead back in the bottom half on a two-run shot by J.D. Martinez. And quickly it's 0-2. Well, if I'm putting together a bullpen, I want guys to get in the ball game and throw strikes. You get the hitter down right away, and he aggressively has jumped ahead of Travis 0-2. That's a fair ball off the glove of Swihart into foul territory. Smoke took a look over his shoulder rounding second and now rumbles into third. Travis aborted first. Blake Swihart making his first career start at first base, and that ball got on him quickly. You hold the runner on, and then you have to bounce off the bag to anticipate a ball hit in your direction. And it was hit back toward the base, and he reaches back to his left and Hits it. He made contact in fair territory, so it's a fair ball. See how he goes back and he goes off his glove. And on the play, Smoke will end up at third. Not sure of the scoring yet on the play, but either way, it's first and third, two down for Curtis Granderson, who has struck out a couple of times today. Looks like it's been scored a base hit. So Smoke at third, Travis at first. 4 2 Boston in the seventh. And a high fly ball to deep center field, but it is playable for Benintendi. And the Blue Jays will leave a couple of men on. They threaten but can't score for two seventh inning stretch. Touched up for a run in the third three up three down fourth but then gave up a homer in the fifth another one in the sixth winds up giving up four earned runs through six. 
Again, 83 pitches. He's very efficient and he's been that consistent throughout all three of his starts. But the home run hurt him today. Three of the four Boston runs that have scored have come on the home run. Edward Nunez, Eduardo Nunez had a solo shot in the fifth, and J.D. Martinez a two-run home run in the sixth. And right-hander Xian Juan O oh is in. This is his first appearance in the series. And with the off day tomorrow, and Ryan Tapera hasn't pitched in this series either. We could see Tapera in the bottom of the eighth, just so he doesn't go too long between appearances. Red Sox four, the Blue Jays two. O oh will face Holt, Swihart, and Vasquez. Bolt to ground out in a fly ball. I think the stuff that we saw from O in his last appearance in Philadelphia was some of the best stuff we've seen from him all season. Yeah, he is really throwing the ball well, and he's got a little bit extra life on his fastball. His slider's got a better bite to it lately. Four consecutive scoreless appearances covering five innings, and in those five innings, he's given up just one hit. Ball poked foul off to the left by Holt. Yeah, he's allowed just one hit and 15 at bats over the span of those four games. Again, the 2 2 to hold. He lays off down low, a full count. Swihart is waiting on deck. He's got a couple of base hits today. Red Sox out hitting the Blue Jays 7 to 3. Boston's committed the only error of the game. That was the Swihart one last half inning, but it didn't hurt him. This ball will slice foul and get back into the seats. Granderson's out in left field today. I asked him when the Blue Jays got to town. I said, obviously, you played here. You were a Tiger. You were a Yankee. But in his younger years, he was almost exclusively a center fielder. So I said, have you played all three spots here? He goes, I've definitely played center. I've definitely played right. He goes, I can't remember if I've played left. So another box check for Curtis Granderson. There's ball four as Holt draws the leadoff ball. It's time to fire up your senses. Your best experience begins with Broil King, available at your local home hardware. Here's how. Here in Boston, Dan Schulman, Buck Martinez, Hazel May. Final game of this series between the Blue Jays and Red Sox. Boston winning the first two and leading here today. Swihart the batter, two for two with a couple of base hits. Is right now on his computer, which is much more powerful than my computer. He's trying to figure out if Granderson's ever played left field <laughs> here at Fenway Park. I can tell, I can hear the tapping. I over there. will do it. Yeah. <laughs> it won't take long. There's a strike one and one. Granderson, as he's gotten older, has transitioned away from just being a center fielder, playing the corners a lot more. He has never started in left field until this series. His game yesterday was the first game he's ever started. He actually go. played in a game in left field, started in center, went to left field in August of 2005. Nook Logan came in as a pinch runner and moved into center, and that pushed Curtis Granderson to right, or excuse me, to left. So the only other time he played was way back in 2005. So it's expected that he wouldn't remember. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing to think 
over so, such a long period of time how few. And Swihart is called out on strikes. How few primary left fielders the Red Sox had. It, it, I'm not talking about the last 10 years or anything, but Ted Williams came up at night. We talked about him being away for a while, but he came up 39 play through 60. From Ted Williams to Carl Yastrzemski to Jim Rice, Hall of Famer to Hall of Famer to Hall of Famer, you're talking about 46, 47 years? Williams was 19, Yaz was 23, and then Rice was after that. And then if you want to take it a step further, Mike Greenwell right. played out there for a long time. But to have Williams and Yaz and Rice play three everyday left fielders and have long extended careers for the Red Sox, it was pretty remarkable how few players played out there. How good was Yaz? Oh, Yaz was yeah. great. He, he did everything with a severe intensity. He was intense about everything he did, but boy, he loved to play left field. And he played that wall perfectly. I can remember him, and he was the best I've ever seen at it, positioning himself on the warning track as if he were going to catch a ball in the air and then turning around and playing the carom and throwing a guy out a second. He was great at it. Of course, he played a long time out there and yeah. had a lot of chances. But it was much more challenging, I think, then because there were a few more nuances to it. I think the scoreboard was a little bit different in that there were many more nooks and crannies to the scoreboard. But yeah, he was great. Obviously, I didn't see Williams play left field, but I saw Yaz and Rice play. Rice was adequate, obviously, but he hit so much who cared. He was a slugger. <laughs> Man, was he a slugger. But Yaz was an all around good player. Yep. He did everything well. He could really throw, too. One and two, the count on Vasquez. One on, one out here, bottom of the seven. One two swing and a miss he got him back to back strikeouts for oh two down and yeah, we had talked about how good his fastball has been lately he's got a little more life to it he's better at commanding it and it's slider and fastball combination have proved to be very effective for O. wanted to go back over a play involving Jackie Bradley and this is my mistake the laces rule we talked about that play at home play where the Blue Jays had the call overturned and an out was called at home plate. The laces rule was changed two years ago, was taken out of the game. So evidently he got him more than with the laces as Bradley bangs one into left field for a base hit. And it was a very quick decision by Major League Baseball in New York by the umpires at the replay review center in New York. I don't know, guys, if we can fire that up one more time to take a look at it. It looked like maybe just the top of the glove grazed. Uh, the wrist of Bradley on the way by and again my mistake for incorrectly thinking it was the laces but right there I guess the top of the glove does get the thumb of Bradley on the way by and that's why the call was overturned that the official report that we received from Major League Baseball said that the tag was applied before the runner reached base reached home plate so that's why they called yeah. him out. Benintendi the batter with runners at first and second and two down. And he goes around, didn't want to, but couldn't hold up 0 and 1. What was that swing? We haven't seen that swing in this series. He was in between as to what he was expecting to get from O. There's a the only awkward swing we've seen him take in three days. To left field, but room for Granderson. And that's all as the Red Sox leave a couple of men on. We go top eight at Fenway, Red Sox four, the Blue Jays two.
Kendrick Will Power looks to carry his momentum forward into race one of the Chevrolet Detroit Grand Prix. It goes Saturday on Sportsnet 1 and Sportsnet 360. And Dan, it could get very loud in Detroit. The race is about a mile from Comerica Park. Oh, that's cool. You an auto racing guy? Oh, yeah. yeah. I like the races. I went from time to time. And, yeah, it's exciting to see one that close to ballpark. I'm Absolutely. sure we'll hear him as they practice and go around. <laughs> Eighth inning, 4-2 Boston. Luke Maley, Gio Urshela, Teoscar Hernandez. Matt Barnes on the mound for Boston. Maley, a strikeout and a fly ball. Fly ball well hit to right field. Bradley going back and makes the catch. Yeah, we talk about right field with Jackie Bradley Jr. out there. He's, in my mind, he's the best center fielder in the American League. I, I just think he's a terrific defender. He throws well, but right field is so challenging, especially in day games here with the sun beating down on you. Mookie Betts plays it well. I always thought Dwight Evans was the best at playing right field for the Red Sox until I saw Mookie Betts out there. I think Mookie Betts is right there with Dwight Evans. He has a great arm. Evans had a cannon for an arm. I think Mookie throws well. I don't know if the arm strength is the same as Evans, but he's certainly accurate. He's very fast, covers a lot of ground. Oh, and two on Urshela. Wondering about a pinch hitter in this situation with the Blue Jays down by two. The Blue Jay bench right now consists of these three players Josh Donaldson, who in all likelihood is unavailable today, Russell Martin, and Dwight Smith Jr. So, yeah, you could send Smith up to hit, but then you got to put somebody in the field, which means getting Martin up and putting him out at third base. And, you know, with uh, the four positions in four days, it looks like uh, they've decided to give Russell Martin the day off today. That's you, and if you are going to pinch hit, you'd probably wait for a better situation, maybe get a couple guys on, and then you got to a point where you said, okay, well, we're going to take a shot right here. The only thing that's impressed me is Dwight Smith Jr. The way he comes off the bench, swinging the bat, he's got a couple pinch hits. He's at a home run already since he's been back with the Blue Jays. Strike three called for out number two. Drive of the game brought to you by the new 2018 Civic SI. When it leads off, it leads for good. Uh, Tony Oscar hadn't hit a home run since the 16th of May. And then he stepped to the plate with a man aboard in the sixth and two outs, and it went high into the Green Monster seats. Home run number eight for Hernandez. RBI is 22 and 23. And that tied the game, but then tie lasted just a half an inning as JD Martinez hit a two run home run in the bottom half of the sixth. And Strike one to Hernandez. We have seen this from both the starter and Eduardo Rodriguez, now Matt Barnes. They're not leaving too many. Pitches out over the plate. No. One down and away, and then the up one right at the top of the strike zone that Hernandez goes after. The radar got here at Fenway said that last pitch was 98 miles an hour. And he's not the closer, Kimbrell, who throws 99, and he's not the main setup guy, Kelly, who throws 100. More velocity in a three out three down inning for Matt Barnes. I don't think he knew there were three outs. He was waiting for the ball to come back to him. That's all you got to do. Time now for a Blue Jays Central update. Jamie Campbell, Kevin Barker for the Samsung Broadcast Studio.
Presented by Honda. The Honda Checkered Flag event is back. It's the best time to find a Honda you love. Four two, the Red Sox lead the Blue Jays as Boston gets set to come up at the bottom of the eighth inning. Red Sox edging closer to a sweep of the Blue Jays. And Ryan Tapera comes into the game, his first appearance of the series. 28th time this season, Tapera has appeared in the game. 3 12 earned run average, picked up a save in Philadelphia. And Tapera actually throwing the ball very well. When he gets rest, as he's had in this situation, he throws the ball very well. He'll be upwards. 96 97 miles an hour from time to time with a very good hard cutting breaking ball. Xander Bogarts leading it off and Bogarts lines one to left field off the monster on the fly. Hit it so hard though he'll have to stop it first with a lead off single. You know, a lot of times we talk about how there are a lot of cheap home runs here. Well, it takes extra bases away, too, because the defenders play so well off the wall. Granderson mentioned his just his second career start in left field here at Fenway Park. Uh, Bogarts drills this fastball, a low liner, and that's going to be a home run in most ballparks, but it's off the green monster, and it's played perfectly by Curtis Granderson. Plays it on one hop and throws a strike to second base to Devin Travis. And Bogarts has to hold with a long single. That'll bring up J.D. Martinez, who homered his last time up. Well, if you compare today's game to the last two from a Blue Jay perspective, and the, the result could be the same, it could be a loss, it's been a cleaner game in the sense that they've been making the plays they, they've needed to make defensively, but they're still not hitting. Three runs Monday, three runs last night, two runs today. First couple of games were, were pretty sloppy here. But yeah, they didn't play well at all yeah. in the aspect. But you know what? I don't think anybody down in that dugout wants to say, well, we played good today. No. They want to win some games. Yeah. 12 and 24 in their last 36. And Boston has won 19 of the last 27 they've played against the Blue Jays. And you mentioned the sweep. The Jays haven't been swept here in Boston since August of 2009. But it's been a very disappointing month of May. One and two the count. Now, to Paris keeping an eye on Bogarts. He didn't have a stolen base this season, but we have seen the Red Sox play aggressive on the bases. They've had a couple of hit and run attempts during this series, a couple of stolen bases. The home run JD Martinez hit last time up in the sixth inning was absolutely crushed. I mean, it was way over the seats out into the street. Might even have reached that parking lot across the street. He's got a chance to wind up with David Ortiz type numbers, which is exactly what they were hoping for. They were missing that guy in the lineup last year after the retirement of Ortiz. And the Red Sox hit the fewest home runs in the American League last year. Kind of hard to believe. You know you never know how a guy's going to react to this atmosphere it's intense I mean there are a couple of places that are really challenging to play New York and Boston and you know the fans are so intense with all their sporting teams that you come in here you better be able to handle it because there are going to be some downtimes David Price has had his problems here since coming to the Red Sox but when they signed J.D. Martinez they were fairly certain he could handle it. Ground ball back towards the mound to Para. And just when we were saying they've been making the plays, skips a throw past Solarte, backed up by Travis, and everybody's safe. Well, Solarte was a little bit late getting to the bag, and he didn't get set up, and then the throw was offline just a bit. And by the time he reached back forward, he couldn't make the play. 
But watch where Salarte is there. Still a little bit late. He took a couple of steps toward the mound and he didn't get to the bag and set himself. He was still on the move when the throw was offline from Tapera. It's not a great throw by any means, but if he gets there earlier, he's got a chance to make a stretch like a first baseman. So tell me what I'm missing here. Solarte started off playing much further away from second than Travis. If Travis is playing much closer to second than Solarte is, why isn't Travis taking the throw at second? Because they were playing him to pull the ball. And I know he hits the ball a lot to right field. But Travis. No, but I mean on a comeback. I understand why they're why. I understand why. Well, what happened was Solarte came thinking that Tapera wasn't going to get the ball. He took a couple of steps toward the ball, and then he changed direction and went to the base. Because it looks to me like Travis started towards the base and then peeled off to back up the play. And Travis was the guy much closer to second at the beginning of the play. But you always see when there's a runner at first, the pitcher looks back to the middle to infielders, and his look is is saying, if there's a comeback, or who am I throwing to? Exactly. Solarte makes the catch for out number one. Well, let's watch and see how it's set up at the start of this play. Take Travis is there at the back. Now watch where he's going to go as the pitch is delivered. So he's there. And then watch Solarte. Now he's going to run toward the ball initially, and then Travis backs up. So that tells me that Travis was not going to cover because he never really went to the base. So before Tapera delivered that pitch, it looked like from the way Travis responded that Solarte had the coverage a second even though he was farther away from the bank. Here's Nunez. So I believe the air was charged to Tapera on the play. On the throw, so it's first and second, one out, 4 2 Boston, bottom eight. Nunez one for three, couple of ground outs and a home run. Yeah, it would be a fielder's choice, and then the air on the pitcher. But again, these are the types of plays we saw in the first two games of this series that Blue Jays just couldn't connect. Ball goes well on his rehab assignment. Presumably, Aledemus Diaz is back at some point in the next several days. He starts playing a lot of shortstop. And then Solarte goes back to being in a second, third, occasional DH kind of rotation. Yeah, and that was the plan coming into the season. He was just going to be that super utility guy that moved all over the place. How about that? Right off the end of the bat into right field, a base hit. And a run will come in to score, and it's going to wind up being a double for Nunez. Nunez has always been a good hitter. And boy, he just reached out and poked that ball. It was probably off the plate away, but he stayed with it and just hit it over in Smoke's head, a soft liner into right field. Watch where this ball is when he makes contact. It's probably a foot off the plate outside, but he gets enough on it to hit it over Smoke's head into right field. His backside was going in one direction, his bat was going in the other direction, and he ends up with an RBI double. When you're hot, you're hot. So, second and third with one out, and the batter is Brock Holt. I'm kind of surprised they're not putting him on, Buck. Swihart, you got a couple guys hitting under 200 after this. Set up a force at the plate, set up a double play. This guy's hurt the Blue Jays. Yeah, he sure has, and they're playing the infield in. I agree with you. I think they could walk him here in this situation. Swihart's on deck. Yeah, he's got a couple of hits, but one of them was a check swing roller up the third base side with the shift on. Two and zero. Oh. Solarte playing right up the middle, standing right beside Nunez. We 
with that loop double by Nunez that's the 16th extra base hit in the series for the Red Sox. Yeah, the Blue Jays have given up extra base hits all season long. Only the Rangers, Orioles, and Royals have given up more extra base hits than the Blue Jays. And left hander Brian Johnson is up in the bullpen now. Kimbrell's just looking on. Knowing that again, if the Red Sox add on, he's not going to pitch. Remember, he caught the home run ball, and then he wound up pitching because they gave some back in the top of the night. But as soon as he caught the home run ball, he sat down in last night's game, three and two on hold. Well, a high strike called on hold there to run it to three and two. I mean, this is the last guy I wanted to play in this situation because he could put the bat on the ball. He's been doing it all season long. Is going to have to throw him a tough pitch to retire him in this situation. And Jake Petrichka is now up for the Blue Jays. Even with an off day tomorrow, John Gibbons doesn't want to prepare to throw too many pitches. At 18 right now, he's got one out. Yeah, I think this is a good time for a bound visit. To pair it called Maley out, he wants to talk about this next pitch because you don't have to give in the holds. You've got a base open. You're down by three already, a base hit right here, and the game's over. So you got to try to get out of this, pitch around him. If you walk him, no problem, deal with the next guy, but I wouldn't give him too much to hit. He's a good contact hitter, and he'll put the bat on the ball. And he does. Did exactly what you just said. And he bounces it into left field, a base hit to add on. That's all he was trying to do. Just put the bat on the ball, and chances are you're going to try to run him. As long as he didn't pull it, he had no intention of pulling it. And that's a big run. That's the sixth run for the Red Sox. And he does. Did exactly what you just said. Bounces it into left field, a base hit to add on. That's all he was trying to do. Yeah, you could say, well, it was a good pitch. It was running down and away from him, but he put the bat on the ball. I think you had a little more leeway to pitch around him, and even if you walked him, you set up a double play, you got a chance to get out of the inning. Once you get to a 3 2 count, I just wouldn't have given in to him. Blake Swihart. Oh, excuse me, Mitch Moreland is up batting for Swihart. So Alex Cora wants to get him into the game. Moreland now pretty much the everyday first baseman after Hanley Ramirez was DFA'd. And Moreland having a terrific year, hitting over 300, hitting for power, got an OPS over 1,000. Uh, he seemed to really be freed up once they made the decision on Hanley Ramirez. He knew he was going to play a lot. Since then, he's been swinging a great bat. More than in this series, just two for eight, but he's stung the ball. He has an RBI and a double. The 0 2. And a swing and a miss. So it's a pair of picks up at number two. And with two down, and runners on the corners, here's Christian Vasquez. Red Sox up 6 2 in the bottom of the eighth inning. 
Nunez is at third, Holtz at first. Laced foul. Jays have now been outscored 22 to 8 in the three game series here at Fenway. Runner goes from first, pitch up and in, throw down by Maley, not in time. Well, the Red Sox are almost running at will against the Blue Jays, and Maley didn't have much of a shot to throw out Rock Holt. He had a great jump at first base for Holt. That's his third stolen base of the season. Never even took a look at home plate, straight steal all the way, throw a little bit offline up the first base side of second. Got him. Vasquez strikes out to end the bottom of the eighth, but not before the Red Sox score two more runs and take a six to two lead to the ninth. Friday in Detroit in the opening game of a three game weekend series against the Tigers. Jaime Garcia coming off his best outing as a Blue Jay will take the bat. Garcia went seven innings against the Phillies, allowed a run on five. He didn't walk a batter and struck out five. The most impressive part of that game, he threw 73 pitches over seven innings. And hopefully he'll be able to do that on Friday night when he opens up against the Tigers. Left hander Brian Johnson in for the Red Sox here in the ninth. The only left hander the Red Sox have down in their bullpen. Johnson's a former starter. And he can perform in many different roles out of that bullpen. And now with a four run lead, Kimbrell takes a seat, and Brian Johnson will try to close this thing out in the ninth inning. And the first pitch is lined into center field. A base hit for Kevin Pilar, his first hit of the afternoon. Last night, as you get another look at this swing by Pilar, Alex Cora had Kimbrell up, sat him down when the Red Sox added on, then had to get him up, get him in the game again. He doesn't want to have to do that today, but I would think if the Blue Jays get one more 
base runner it's going to get serious out in that bullpen. Yeah and he's already up. He's already back on the mound. He's got a ball he's getting ready to throw. Now you don't want to have him have to rush to get ready. Yeah he starts throwing right away as soon as that leadoff man got on. Yeah here Solarte is the batter for the Blue Jays he's 0 for 3. And he lines a ball into left field. Pilar is on his way to third. Solarte will stop with a long single, and just like that, first and third, nobody out. Boy, oh boy, you sit here now in this top of the ninth, thinking, man, I wish we wouldn't have given up those runs. Two runs in the eighth inning. But a different ball game it is now. You still have to trail by four. Curveball that he really took a nice stroke at. As he stays back, uses his hands. JD Martinez played it well off the wall to keep Solarte to a long single. And now Devers and Vasquez come over to the mound to give Kimbrell enough time. And Core is not going to wait another minute. He's out of the dugout. He's going to make the change. So Brian Johnson comes up, gives up two bullets. And Kimbrell has had enough time in Core's mind to get ready. And that's it. When you've got a closer like Craig Kimball, you certainly not going to waste him time, waste any time getting him in this game and kind of try to defuse this situation quickly. 6 2, two men on, and Kimball coming on from the bullpen. Will try to overcome Craig Kimbrell. They were unable to do it last night. Take their shot at him again here today. Kimbrell came in to get the final two outs of the ball game. He struck out Kevin Pillar and then got Solart down a fielder's choice. And for the Red Sox, that ninth inning began very much like this ninth inning. Hector Velasquez gave up a double, a single, a single, and then got Granderson to fly out before Kimbrell was summoned from the bullpen and put an end to the threat. First and third with nobody out in a four run game and here comes Justin Smoke who's one for three today. Shift on for the Blue Jays for the Red Sox rather three on the right side. And a gaping hole on the left side of the infield Pilar could walk halfway down the line but obviously his run doesn't matter they get a lot of work to do. Smoke has hit a home run against Kimbrell. He's two for seven against the Red Sox closer. And the breaking ball misses low ball one. Through just 11 pitches last night. 
Inning began with a base hit by Kevin Pillar, then Jan Hervis Solarte followed it up with a single into the left field corner, advancing Pillar to third. One and one. Simple approach for Kimbrough. Fastball and a hard breaking ball. It's a curveball and it just breaks for days. And it comes right at you. Throws his curve harder than a lot of guys throw their sliders. 86. And it's a tough pitch. Donaldson, he talked about getting a chance to pinch hit. He's got a calf injury. It'll be interesting to see if there's a situation where he might be considered. Two and two on smoke. Andres Morales on deck. Devin Travis scheduled after him. And again, Donaldson with a bat in hand. I think the Morales at bat is the key at bat, the way he's been swinging the bat. He's been hitting the ball hard. Another base hit today. Inside. Says Jerry Lane, and you can see where Pitchcast had it. Blue Jays will take it. It's three and two. Kimber really trying to regroup after he thought he had struck out and smoked. Three two. Up and away. And the walk loads the bases. And Morales is going to come up as the potential tying run. Yeah, I think this is a good opportunity for the Blue Jays, the way he's been swinging the bat. Nobody has terrific numbers against Kimbrough, but Morales is one for three, and that one hit is a home run. And the way he's been swinging the bat lately, he's really been driving the ball. So he's a fastball hitter. Almost everybody gives him a first pitch breaking ball. Right. You're facing a guy who throws 99. So you got to gear up for 99. But don't you kind of think Kimball's going to throw him a first pitch curveball? Yeah, I do, but he's got to be disciplined enough to take it. Even if he throws a first pitch curveball, chances are it's not going to be a strike. And I know that's a difficult thing because he throws it so hard. It's 86, as we've seen in this inning. But Morales really has to be disciplined. Until he gets to two strikes to look for a fastball. 6 2, bases loaded, nobody out. Curveball in the dirt, ball one. Just lay off of that pitch. You don't have to offer at it until you get two strikes. You don't have to worry about it. Just gear up for that fastball. Fastball lined hard into the right field corner. Pilar is in to score. Solarte is in to score. Smoke to third on a ringing two run double by Kendris Morales that makes it six to four. Yeah, Kendris is back. He is really able to get to that fastball, and he did a great job of laying off that first curveball. It wasn't close, but he's been stinging the ball throughout this entire series. Fifth double of the season. And he gets that pitch and it's right out over the heart of the plate and he hammers it. The Red Sox are fortunate that he didn't get it in the air as he lines it and goes all the way to the wall. Jackie Bradley Jr. plays it back in. Smoke ends up in third and Morales is out of the ball game in favor of the pinch runner Dwight Smith Jr. Because that's the tying run. Not at second base still nobody out of the ninth inning. Devin Travis bats. Curtis Granderson on deck, 6 4. That ball was smoked. Travis won for three. He went around, so he did not have the discipline on that first pitch curveball that Morales did. 
Well, this plays right into Devin's favor. Now he's got to really focus on right center. Stay on the ball. Check your ego on the on deck circle. And don't worry about getting beat inside. Yeah. I mean, even a ground ball to the right side scores a run, moves the runner to third with one out. Productive outs aren't the sexiest things in the world, but this is one situation where it could come in handy. Especially with nobody out. I mean, you have to have a productive at bat right here because the next guy is a left handed hitter. Smoke at third, Smith at second. 1 1 upstairs. Aaron Loop up in the bullpen if this gets to the bottom of the ninth. And I guess Donaldson hits if it gets as far as Mailey. If Donaldson's able to hit, he's sure looking like he's put himself under consideration with John Gibbons. Ground ball to third. And again we talked about right side scores a run moves Smith to third left side doesn't do it. Yeah and you might be wondering why smoke didn't break. Devers was back at third but smoke isn't the guy you want breaking on a ball hit to the third baseman because Devers would throw him out. So you still got two runners in scoring position you can still tie it up. With a base hit by Granderson. Who is one for seven in his career against Kimbrell? The one hit is a home run. Game winning home run. He hit a 2 0 fastball. The pitch. Hendricks Morales with a two run double here in the top of the ninth inning to make it a two run game. And a base hit could tie it. The outfield arms are very good. Benintendi has five out his assists. Jackie Bradley Jr. throws very well. He's got a couple. J.D. Davis isn't very deep at all. J.D. Martinez, excuse me, in left field, he's not deep at all. So anything hit in his direction is going to be difficult for Smith to score. Two and one. Does he get the fastball here? He did. Got the curveball again. Two and two. Yeah, Kimbrough has 339 saves, so he's not going to give in to a hitter. He can throw that breaking ball. As you see Russell Martin starting to stir around in the dugout. Well, Donaldson. Hits for somebody. Martin may need to come in and play in the field, but let's wait till we get there. I think Donaldson's doing that on his own. 2 2. Pilar got it started with a single. Solarte singled him to third. Then in came Kimbrell. He walks Smoke to load the bases. Morales with a two run double. Morales leaves for Smith, the pinch runner. Travis grounds out. And now Granderson. Two down. Great breaking ball from Kimbrell. You just never know which pitch you're going to get, and you can see it's just hard breaking ball to the outside part of the plate. Two strikes, tough one to take. You know it's breaking coming back toward that outside corner. And Kimbrell will now face Luke Maley. So I think you're right, Buck. I think Donaldson was doing it on his own. He is apparently either not available or just Gibby doesn't want to use him. As that pitch is swung on, hit out to second. On the first, and the Red Sox win it. 
Blue Jays make it interesting in the ninth. Russell Martin, by the way, was out in the on deck circle. He was going to bat for Urshela if it got that far, but it never did. Kimbrell gets it done, gets the save, and the Red Sox sweep the Blue Jays. Well, I think Alex Cora made a quick decision and a good one when he went right to Kimbrell after two consecutive singles to start the ninth inning. Kimbrell came in, walked the first batter. Morales gets the two run double, but that was it. He got his closer in there, and the Red Sox sweep the three game series over the Blue Jays. So, an off day for the Blue Jays.